Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Fernando Florido and I'm a GP in the United Kingdom. In today's episode, I look at another random case of hypertension to see how the NICE guidelines could apply to it, focusing on the pharmacological treatment. By way of disclaimer, I'm not giving medical advice. This is for healthcare professionals and it is only my interpretation of the guidelines, so you must use your own clinical judgment. Remember that there's also a podcast version of these videos, so have a look in the description below. Right, so let's generate a random patient. If you want to miss this, just go to the next track on this video. Right, so we have a 45 year old man whose ethnicity is white and who presents with a clinic blood pressure of 180 over 65 and who has two other comorbidities which are peripheral vascular disease and CKD and who is on treatment for hypertension and who is on three different types of antihypertensive drugs an alpha blocker which is terazosin 10 milligrams daily he's also on spironolactone 25 milligrams daily and the calcium channel blocker, which is felodipine, 2.5 milligrams daily. Okay, so we have a 45 year old Caucasian man presenting in clinic with a blood pressure of 180 over 65, so quite significant isolated systolic hypertension. He has two other comorbidities, peripheral vascular disease and CKD, and he's on treatment, and therefore we will assume that he has already been diagnosed with hypertension. He's on three different antihypertensive drugs, an alpha blocker, terazosin 10 mg daily, a calcium channel blocker, felodipine 2.5 mg daily, and spironolactone 25 mg daily. So what are my initial thoughts? Well, two really. The first one is that he's fairly young and he has significant hypertension despite being on three different medications. The second is that, on first impressions, his treatment looks rather strange and we will need to look into this in more detail. We will treat his clean blood pressure as accurate. NICE says that for people who have been diagnosed with hypertension, we can use clinic blood pressure measurements to monitor drug treatment, so there is no need for ambulatory blood pressure monitor or home blood pressure monitors unless you suspect issues. For the purpose of this case, we will also say that he is not under any form of stress and that his high clinic blood pressure reading is like other readings that he has been getting on his home monitor. So there is no concern about white coat hypertension. It is also worrying that at 45 he already has peripheral vascular disease and CKD and that makes me wonder whether there is something else going on here that we are missing. Could this patient have renovascular hypertension? He has peripheral vascular disease, so we know that there is a significant degree of atherosclerosis. Could this be affecting his renal arteries? Also, he has CKD. Whilst one of the possible reasons for the drop in EGFR could simply be hypertensive nephropathy, could it also be due to a fall in renal perfusion secondary to bilateral renal artery stenosis? I think that this patient may very well warrant further investigations and referral. NICE says that we should consider further investigations and or referral in people with signs and symptoms suggesting a secondary cause of hypertension. So in this case, good ways to start would be auscultating the renal areas for the detection of pruits, checking for proteinuria or macroalbuminuria and organising a Doppler ultrasound scan of the kidneys. I would also look at his records and see when his hypertension was first diagnosed. NICE says that we need to consider referral for patients under 40 with hypertension for the evaluation of secondary causes of hypertension. So if this patient's hypertension started more than 5 years ago and he was never fully investigated, a referral would be really recommended. I will now look at his medication. Whilst his drug combination seems a little odd, let's try and think of reasons why this could be the case. If we have a look at the NICE guidelines, we will see that the first drug of choice for a person under the age of 55 and not of black African or Afro-Caribbean family background is an ACE inhibitor or an ARP. 
We also know that in the small print, NICE also tells us that for people with hypertension and CKD, we need to follow the NICE guideline on CKD, which also emphasizes the need to prescribe an S inhibitor or ARB if there is macrobiminuria of 30 or more. And yet, this patient is not on an S inhibitor or ARB. Why could this be? Perhaps, if there is indeed renal artery stenosis, the previous initiation of an ACE inhibitor or ARB caused a significant and progressive deterioration of his renal function, and this is why it was stopped. Remember that for the deterioration in renal function to be significant after an ACE inhibitor or ARB, the EGFR has to drop persistently by more than 25%, or the creatinine has to increase persistently by more than 30%. Another reason may be that the drugs were not tolerated, for example, because of a cough. A cough is a common side effect of ACE inhibitors, and it is normally managed by switching to an ARB. But although much rarer, a cough can also be a side effect of ARBs, so this could be a reason for not being on these drugs. If this was the reason, I would check if the side effect happened at lower or higher doses, and I would see if a lower dose of an ACE inhibitor or ARB could be tolerated on the basis that a small dose of an ARB or ACE inhibitor is better than no ACE inhibitor or ARB at all. Or perhaps these drugs are not being used because of hyperkalemia? If so, did the hyperkalemia happen when the patient was already on spironolactone? Perhaps it was the combination of these two drugs rather than the ACE inhibitor or ARB medication in isolation. Another reason could be the development of angioedema, which is not that uncommon with ACE inhibitors. Normally, if this happened, you would switch the patient to an ARB, but although much rarer again, angioedema can also be a side effect of ARBs. So that could be another reason for stopping. This patient is also on two other drugs, spironolactone and an alpha blocker, that are usually reserved for step 4 treatment when the combination of, a, of an ACE inhibitor and ARB, a calcium channel blocker and a thiazide like diuretic have failed to control the blood pressure. The patient is on its calcium channel blocker but not on a thiazide like diuretic. Why? I would check if it has been tried before and whether it could not be tolerated, for example because of gout. Although bendroflumethiazide is the one typically associated with a rise in uric acid and worsening gout, it can also happen with other thiazide-like diuretics, such as indapamide and hydrochlorothiazide. Perhaps this is the reason why spironolactone was prescribed instead of the thiazide-like diuretic? And perhaps it is the issue of spironolactone I am most uncomfortable with. Being a drug at step 4, I feel that it shouldn't have been initiated before the rest of his treatment has been optimised, especially in view that the history doesn't give any other indications for it, such as chronic heart failure. And the issue of the alpha blocker is looking into too. I would look to see if perhaps it has been prescribed because the patient suffers from urinary outflow obstruction and it was thought that we could, so to speak, kill two birds with one stone. Remember that terazosine is licensed for both hypertension and benign prostatic hyperplasia. And finally, the dose of his calcium channel blocker is low. Felodipine can go up to 10 mg daily and he's only on 2.5 mg daily. As long as he has not developed leg or ankle edema, as a side effect on higher doses in the past, increasing the dose could be an option. Right, having said all this, in order to progress with the case, we will say the following. 1. There are no signs of renal artery stenosis and it has been fully investigated for secondary causes for hypertension and it has been concluded that he has essential or primary hypertension. 2. The reason for not being on an ACE inhibitor or ARB is because a cough developed with lisinopril 2.5 mg daily and also when the dose of losartan went from 50 to 100 mg daily. 3. Felodipine has never been given at a higher dose than 2.5 mg daily and currently there is no ankle edema. 4. A thiazide like diuretic was not tolerated because of gout, but since then the patient has been started on allopurinol to reduce his uric acid levels, so gout no longer seems to be a problem. 5. Terazosine was given in place of tamsilosin, which was recommended by his urologist for benign prostatic hyperplasia. And 6. There is no other indication for spironolactone.
Right, so bearing all this in mind, what would I do? My interpretation would be that, given that small doses of an ARB were tolerated before, I would try to restart losartan at 25 mg daily, increasing to 50 mg daily to see if it is tolerated at lower doses without causing a cough. On doing this, I would stop spironolactone to minimize the risk of hyperkalemia, and also because there's no real indication for spironolactone at this stage. I would also, at the same time, increase philodipine to 5 mg daily, and possibly to 10 mg daily soon after, depending on the response. And I would keep him on terazosine 10 mg daily for the benefit on his benign prostatic hyperplasia. And I says that before considering further treatment for a person with resistant hypertension, we should confirm it by using ambulatory or home blood pressure recordings. We should also assess for postural hypotension and we should discuss adherence. And NICE also says that for people with confirmed resistant hypertension, we could consider adding a fourth antihypertensive drug as step four treatment or seeking specialist advice. If it came to that, what would I do? I may be tempted to refer him because of his young age, but you could also argue in favor of adding a fourth drug. Which one would I choose in this case? I might start by trying a thiazide like diuretic now that his gout is under control, as he may tolerate it now. Unfortunately, both indapamide and hydrochlorothiazide can potentially interact with allopurinol, increasing the risk of hypersensitivity reactions. And although the manufacturer makes no recommendations in this respect, it is a severe theoretical risk. In this situation, I would consider changing the gout treatment from allopurinol to an alternative agent, something like febusoxstat, and then add, for example, indapamide modified release 1.5 mg daily for his hypertension. If the patient or you did not want to change his gut medication for a reason, the other two options would be spironolactone and a beta blocker. You could start spironolactone if the potassium levels are below 4.5, but watching the levels carefully as the combination of an ACE inhibitor or ARB and spironolactone can increase the risk of hyperkalemia. If the baseline potassium levels are above 4.5, the choice would be restricted to a beta blocker. However, remember that beta blockers are contraindicated in severe peripheral vascular disease, so this may be a problem in this patient. However, when there is no alternative, sometimes a cardioselective beta blocker may be used cautiously under specialist supervision if the peripheral vascular disease is not severe. But remember that this is only my interpretation, so it's not necessarily the best option. Please let me know your views in the comment section below. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful. If so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.